Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Thank you for joining me today for the podcast. I have a very special guest that I'd like to present to you, whose name is R. Period Renee. That's that's what she goes by publicly, but we're going to call her Sister Renee today, <laughs> and she is author of. The Tithing Hoax, Exposing the Lies, Misrepresentations, and False Teachings about Tithing. That 10% thing. And or actually, I should have said she's co-author. Her co-author for the book is Cynthia Harper. We have our Renee, and we're going to talk about the Tithing Hoax and the things that she discovered that I trust will be a blessing to you to find out this information. We have been, as I like to say, hoodwinked, bamboozled, bushwhacked, snookered, hornswoggled, and tricked by some of the teachings that come from the church. And we know this goes the world over. And to find this out will be controversial for, for some. Some of you go, you know, I kind of knew that wasn't right, but I just didn't know how to put my hands on it. Well, you're going to find out today, you're going to have the information, you're going to have the ammunition, so you can be made free. Jesus said he came to make men free, and whom he has made free is free indeed. So today, thank you for joining me, Sister Renee. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for the invite and reaching out to me and allow me to uh, uh, present uh, information about tithing on your platform. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm, you are most welcome, and I am greatly humbled by your agreement to come on. I thank you so very much. That was a blessing to me when you said yes. I rejoiced because I like putting information out there that blesses folk. You can't put a price tag on that. If you've ever been made free from something, uh, I know I have. When you get just a little tidbit of information that just releases you from some form of bondage, uh, or when the Lord delivers you from something, you know what that feels like. And so when we can be the conduit for that as his agents in this earth, we we know that we bless somebody in, in words, really words unspeakable. Mm -hmm. So before we continue, let's let's begin with prayer. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of King Jesus asking you, Lord, today to bless this podcast. We pray your anointing be placed upon this podcast for the listener and for the words that we speak. We pray that only you are magnified in this effort. Lord, we pray that only those things you would have us to disseminate will be disseminated today, that this will bless the listener and all subsequent listeners. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to come together in fellowship and to magnify you in this topic. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 And amen. <laughs> so sister Renee, before we get too far down the road mm -hmm. uh, about the book and what you discovered, can you tell me about a little bit about yourself and how you came to faith in Christ? Okay. Um, uh, I guess, first of all, I'll start by saying that I'm a uh, native of Washington, D.C., and I currently live um, down south, and I graduated from college with a degree in political science pre-law, and also have certifications in marketing, and so uh, professionally, I have worked in the private sector, and I also worked with government agencies, and for the past five plus years, I've been working as a freelance writer. Now, as far as my, my spiritual journey, you know, I was baptized at age 11 and I grew up as a Baptist, Southern Baptist. <laughs> and in church, I served as a Sunday school teacher and a secretary. And, and so um, that's a little bit, uh, a very brief background of, of about me. <laughs> Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, so about what age 
this this is always controversial. <laughs> There's a big controversy about this. I don't know if you're aware about children can't be saved, which I know the devil is a liar. But uh, about what time would you say you came to faith in Christ? About what age were you? Yeah, I had to be um, around 11 or 12 years old. Um, my mom and I had moved back to her hometown um, when I was 11. And one of the first things my grandmother told me, she said, okay, it's time for you to get baptized. <laughs> and so, and, and that's what happened. I was baptized uh, at age, yeah, at 11, age 11. And I was baptized in an actual bayou. So I wasn't a, a swim, swimming pool, <laughs> a pool in the church. I was baptized in an actual bayou. Um, and, uh, and I received the right hand of fellowship at, at, at uh, a Baptist church. And so that's my foundation. Okay, praise the Lord. Now, how did you and your co-author come to write this book? What triggered you to say, we need to write this book, The Tithing Hoax? Um, you know, what is interesting is it was not my idea to write this book. This book was what I call a God idea. So I'm going to give you a brief background. Um, it was in the early 2000s, and I was questioning, questioning my purpose. And I would always ask myself, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? What do I want to do? And one day I heard a voice say, ask a different question. And the question was this, God, what do you want me to do? And the response came from the Holy Spirit, and it was to write a book about tithing. And, and that's where the idea came from. And, and then I asked, you know, Cynthia to join me on this journey of, of getting the book completed, but it was definitely a God idea because I really didn't, <laughs> I really didn't want to write the book, to be honest. Uh, is, is that because you knew it was going to be work? <laughs> there was so many issues. Um, I didn't feel I was qualified to write a book on it because at the time I didn't know much about tithing. I mean, the only thing I really knew about tithing is that the word tithe meant 10%. So, so I didn't feel like I was qualified. I didn't know much about it and I struggled with it. And I also was afraid of the controversy. I was afraid of what, of the judgment and the criticism I would uh, possibly face because I knew I did know it was a controversial and taboo topic uh, within the body of Christ, and so I was kind of going back and forth about this book and 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 dealing with God about this, and God revealed to me, it's like you know what, this is why I want you to write the book. It's because you are number one, you are a blank slate, because me growing up. Southern Baptist, you know, tithing was never an issue. We didn't pay tithes. We weren't taught a tithe doctrine. We gave offerings and we paid, you know, we gave, we paid church dues. And, and so what, you know, the father was revealing to me is that I was a blank slate, meaning I did not have a, uh, a, a, a biased, if you will, toward it, toward tithing one way or the other. So in other words, I can be very open and objective about the topic. And so right. from there, you know, I began to obviously learn about the topic. And it was very, it was very interesting time because I was listening to a lot of uh, Christian uh, broadcasts on television and on radio. And it seemed like everybody and his mother was talking about tithing, tithing, tithing. They were really pushing this whole tithing thing. And something did stir in my spirit where I felt like something about this whole tithing thing isn't right or what's being taught isn't right. But I didn't know what it was. 
So, so this was a journey for, for me personally to, to, to learn about this topic and to share what I've learned uh, to help others in the body of Christ who have been struggling with this, this particular teaching and with this practice. And um, so out of that, you know, it, the book came to fruition. And so the focus um, with the book has been to expose the false, false teachings, but not only to expose the false teachings around tithing, but also to correct those teachings. So it, it was a, a personal journey for me, a spiritual journey, journey um, as well um, for me. And uh, so, yeah, I had to overcome <laughs> my own my own issues to deliver the message. And 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 so what I one of the things I learned is that, you know, the message is bigger than me, that this was much bigger than me. I was given an assignment and I had to put my my hangups aside and I had to overcome my own hangups to um, do what God had called me to do. In the book, you have a chapter called The Gospel of Greed. Mm -hmm. How do you define what you call the gospel of greed? For, for me, I, okay. Yeah, for me, I define it as misusing biblical script, uh, scripture and exploiting God's people for selfish material gain. And that's, for me, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I certainly <laughs> think that's accurate. Do you have an example of another, another thing I, I saw you quote in the book, tithing foolishness that you have witnessed or heard about that you can share with us? Because I know when we spoke the first time we talked, we did talk about this, how we saw this. I'd, li I'd like to know if you'd like to give us a few examples. Hmm. Yes. Um, you know, in the book, I, I talk about, you know, there's a there's a thin line between faith and foolishness. Um, and sometimes blind faith leads us to do things that are foolish. And I say foolish, I don't mean that um, as an insult to to anyone. You know, we've all done things um that uh, have always not served us well, even though we thought we were acting out of faith. And so, you know, over the years uh, since publishing uh, the book, you know, I've heard all sorts, sorts of stories. And, you know, I've heard of situations where people would pay their tithes and not pay the mortgage on their homes and ended up losing their homes to foreclosure. Mm. Um, there was a situation where a sister reached out to me and she had, I, I don't recall if she was married or, but I do know she was in a relationship um, and that her relationship ended and she, and, and she said she had a good man and her relationship ended because of all the issue of tithing. Apparently they had uh, different views about tithing and it destroyed their relationship. You know, and there's also a situation where uh, a young lady who was college age and she was attending a mega church and she was being interviewed and she was saying that she was paying her ties to this church religiously to the point to where she didn't have money to pay for groceries. So instead of using her money, what money she had to buy grocery, groceries and feed herself, she would find herself trying to name and claim groceries. So, but that's because she has so much faith in the practice of tithing. Mm -hmm it led her to do something that was very impractical, you know? <laughs> so that's why I talk about where, where foolishness steps in 
and, and, and people end up sabotaging themselves in the name of this doctrine, you know. So wow. those were just a, a few examples of how tithing has had an adverse impact on the lives of, of um, some believers. And I always call, I call these tithing horror stories, you know. Mm, yes. You know, last night I was talking to my mother because I, she knew that I was going to interview you today. And we talked about some of these instances because I'm a PK's kid. My father was associate pastor uh, for many years at, at a church down in Long Beach. And mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of funny because at least two of the, the accounts you just mentioned, I witnessed going to this church that believed in the, the practice of tithing. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because when my parents ended up leaving that church, even to go into another church, this was the practice. And I remember her and my father had words over this. It wasn't anything crazy. Just they were in disagreement. Like you described it, that couple mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. separated. My mother was like, I'm not going to pay it. <laughs> It, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel right to me. It feels like bondage. We ain't supposed to be in bondage in Christ. They had this discussion. You know how children mm -hmm. are. You, you stand it and you in a room, you hear everything, right? Right. So right. Uh, we talked about this last night. And so they came to the agreement. He would pay his tithe from his check. He said, I ain't got no, I ain't got no, you know, I'm not going to try to step between you doing that. If that's what you feeling led to do. But when it come to my check. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not paying it and they agreed to disagree on that so mm. i remember this and i know you know my dad he just this is how they get people it's really infuriating when you step on the other side and see what's being done they use a person's dedication to the lord yes against them to to cause them to be in this bondage because they will feel like they are being disobedient to god Yes. If they don't pay this tithe. Yes. That's I also saw people do exactly. I'm in the church now. I'm just like, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Seeing this stuff. People would have the money for their bills. Mm -hmm. God provided them. They struggling through life at that time. God mm -hmm. provided them the money for their bills. Everything was met. But because they had to pay their tithe. And we went through it as a family. Until my mother drew that line. <laughs> Until my right. mother drew that line. She said, nah. Uh, we, we're not doing it. They take money from their other bills that they had everything covered. And then I, they got to believe God for their gas bill money and their light bill money and whatever. When he mm -hmm. gave it to them to begin with, but they took it and gave it to the church. Gave it to the church. Yes. I mean, those are real stories. I, you know, I had encountered another story with a, a young lady on Twitter. And she had the money for her rent, but she took a portion of that rent money and tied it to the church. And then was looking like, okay, I'm going to believe God to help me pay my rent. And I'm like, sister girl, you, God had already provided you with the provision to pay your rent. So now she was like, okay, now how am I going to pay my, pay my rent? So, yeah. but like yeah, you it's, said, it's really sad. Yeah, it is it's it's sad. And and like you were saying, you know, how some of these um religious leaders take advantage of people's devotion to the Lord because inherently for many believers, they want to do what's right. And they really believe that by paying these tithes, they're doing what's right. And if they don't pay the tithes, they have been led to believe that. They are being disobedient and that opens the door to them feeling shame, guilt, condemnation if they don't. Like you're a bad Christian if you don't tithe. Yep. You don't really oh, yeah. believe in God if you don't tithe. Oh, yeah. And that's it question your faith and your salvation if you don't mm -hmm. tithe. Mm hmm. And and there's no greater pressure, I don't think, <laughs> even even peer pressure, than the pressure that comes over that pulpit 
And then also the internal pressure, once you believe something incorrectly that you put on yourself because of what's being taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, I, I, and I think for some believers that, that for many, that man or woman in the pulpit to them, they're like those individuals, like the closest thing to God. So if, if the pastor said it, then it must be true. If the pastor said it, it must be right and exact. Because after all, that's the pastor. That's the that's the man of God or that's the woman of God. You know, so and th so there's this also this tendency of not wanting to question. What's being taught. But as we point out in the tithing hoax, you know, in Thessalonians, Thessalonians, it tells us that's everything and hold to that which is good. So to question, to test something, you're going to question it. So it's nothing wrong with questioning something, especially if it doesn't, you know, it may not seem right to you, you know, something about it. You know, the individuals in a pulpit are regular people, the men and women, just like the people sitting in the pews. And, you know, again, that's a whole other issue of putting these individuals on a pedestal. They don't get everything right. We don't get everything right. So, you know, we have to. We have to keep things in, in, in perspective. And not treat. The individuals in the pulpit as if they cannot be in error about anything that, that, that they say. Yeah, and one thing I've learned, especially in church situations, and you probably found this to be true, too. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but where if you're in disagreement with the pastor on a particular issue, sometimes you just have to accept that you don't agree with them. You don't have to get into it over it. You know, you mm -hmm. can go speak to them about it and ask them questions. And if if you arrive at a place that you don't agree, you just accept that. It's like... Uh, like my mom did. She went to this church for many years, uh, but she there wasn't nothing to argue about. He teaching it. I don't agree. I'm just gonna sit there and listen. But but <laughs> it was no argument. I just don't. I know that that ain't accurate. And I have to do that all the time with certain preachers, and I'm sure you do too. You hear things mm -hmm. that you know according to scripture is not quite right, but we mm -hmm. still receive them. They're still brother and they're still sister, and we just don't agree on this particular issue. We ain't got to fight about it because there's a lot of good men and women of God. They just, like I said, mm -hmm. we all, every last one of us, have right. blind spots when it comes to the Bible. We don't know it all. Mm -hmm. We're all trying to piece this thing together and get the puzzle, the puzzle right. So exactly. we just mm -hmm. have to receive and you know and keep on and you know receive what we can receive, reject godly what. We should reject and keep on moving. We don't have to fight about everything. <laughs> so, right, right. <laughs> is tithing the way to prosperity, in your opinion? Uh, based on uh, my understanding of the Bible and what's <laughs> in the Bible, I would say no. Um, tithing in and of itself wasn't presented as a way to become prosperous. In the Bible, God promises ancient Israel prosperity and other blessings if they were obedient to the Mosaic law. So the key was to be obedient to the whole law. <laughs> so when you go to Deuteronomy 28 and it, 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 it illustrates all of the blessings and all the curses, all of that was contingent upon following all the commandments and the ordinances and the statutes. It was never just about tithing, but in the modern day church, uh, some of the preachers have made it all about tithing. And they've kind of taken tithing out of the Mosaic law and have enforced it and imposed it onto uh, the body of Christ and have taught it that it is a means to gaining health, wealth, and prosperity. But that's not in line with what the Bible actually teaches. 
once you put tithing back within the context of the Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. And so under the Mosaic law, what was the purpose of the tithe? Yeah, the biblical tithe um, was a means of supporting the Levitical priesthood uh, within ancient Israel. Uh, the tribe of Levi was the only tribe that did not receive a land inheritance. And, and listeners can refer to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verse 9. And so God commanded the other tribes to tithe crops and herds to the tribe of Levi. And again, I offer scriptural reference, um, Numbers chapter 18, verses 21 through 32. Now, also in terms of the history of tithing, you know, I say this, uh, and we mention this in the book, that, you know, we have biblical history, but we must also take into account that the Bible was not compiled within a vacuum. There's also, you know, history outside of the Bible. And so, as a body of Christ, we must also know and understand that, you know, biblical tithing also ended when the Romans destroyed the second Jewish temple, or I prefer to say the Hebrew temple in 70 AD. And this is according to Hebrew historian Flavius Josephus. So with the destruction of the second temple, there was no longer a central location for the Hebrew people to send their tithes. And plus, with the destruction of the temple, the second temple, it also marked the end of the Levitical priesthood. And that's important because the only people, the only people God authorized to receive tithes were the Levites. And mm. more importantly, God replaced the Levitical priesthood with the priesthood of Christ, which we read about in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 19, as well as verses 20 through 25. Yes, and he issues no such commandment in the New Testament Correct. as our high priest to tithe. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, we need to start a firestorm right there. <laughs> Oh. Praise the Lord, but it's us according to the scripture. So I have a term I like to use how people, when they're being deceived by the people who are doing the deceiving, they use Jedi mind tricks on us. Now, mm -hmm. I I know, I want to make sure I correct, make keep the record straight, that many of these preachers believe this. Not, they're not doing it with the intent to deceive Although I know there are probably some that do, <laughs> that they know better, but mm -hmm. this is a way to Jedi mind trick the people. Yeah, God knows he sees the heart, but right. a lot of them are under the same spell <laughs> that's been mm -hmm. cast through the manipulation of scripture to put people into this bondage, to feel obligated to do something that was only for the nation of Israel. And once mm -hmm. the nation of Israel was essentially dissolved slash scattered, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know they're going to be restored. But right now, they they don't exist. they scattered all over the world. Then, because mm -hmm. uh, we're going to get in trouble on that, we don't... <laughs> in a minute, the, mm -hmm. um, the nation of Israel having been scattered all over the world and the Levitical priesthood basically disbanded, yes. then there is no obligation to tithe because it was for their support. This is what a lot of people don't even know that, mm -hmm. that they were, they were to minister to the needs of the people. So how are they going to go work a job when that was their job? So, right. so the people supported them so that they could only attend to the needs of the people and to what God had instructed them to do as priests. And mm -hmm. this is the purpose of the tithe. And a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know that God has need of nothing. What, what would he, but you know what they like to use is Malachi, 
bring mm-hmm. ye all the tithe to the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, saith the Lord, right? Mm-hmm. But that was still according to the Levitical priesthood. Mm-hmm. But they right. made it where that has to support the church. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. And in the, in the storehouse, and they try to make the modern day church the same as the storehouse. And that's not the case. The storehouse was just that is where they stored the tithes. And when the when Malachi speaks of meat, <laughs> I mean literally meat. That's where they kept the, the grain and the crops and the you know uh, uh, the cattle and so forth. So it, the storehouse itself was not a place of worship. And 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 also I want to uh, bring to mention in speaking about history. So I don't want to overlook this this fact, historical fact as well, is that when it comes to the fact that tithing was not practiced in the new church, new church, excuse me, New Testament church for I've heard from the range of 300 years to 800 years, it wasn't practiced. And tithing this this modern day tithe, this monetary tithe tithe, which isn't biblical, was actually introduced by Roman emperors Constantine and Charlemagne. They were the ones who introduced the monetary tithe into Christianity. And this Wow. Is- I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, wow. No. Yeah, and this is according <laughs> to the Catholic Encyclopedia of 1913. And, and the listeners can go online and look this up. So I don't want you to think RNA is not making this up. <laughs> okay. So this was this was basically a form of taxation. And what they used with the tithe was to build these extravagant church buildings and to support the lifestyles of the church bishops. The, the, and that sounds kind of familiar. Um, <laughs> but that's how they wow. yeah, that's how tithing was this monetary tithe was introduced into Christianity because it wasn't there for anywhere from 300 to 800 years. It was not part of the New Testament church. It wasn't God who said, hey, Christians need to tithe. It was Roman emperors who say, hey, you all need to pay these tithes. Now we see why it's important to study and be good Bereans so we don't get Jedi mind tricked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so now this is a great, I think this is a great uh, point. I was going to ask you what what was the greatest point you wanted to share. I think we just heard it, but <laughs> about the Titan host, but I don't want to assume you might have another bomb you could drop. Um, I'll just go ahead and ask you what is the greatest point? that you'd like to share that exposes the tithing hoax? Cause that was definitely heavy. That was one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. This may not be as heavy. I guess it's, it's all in the ears of the listener, I guess. But I, I say is to study the word for yourself. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15. You see, when you hear a religious leader preach or teach something that doesn't seem right to you, I say pay attention to that because that may be the Holy Spirit speaking to you. So ask God to reveal the truth regarding any teaching or doctrine that troubles your spirit. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, we, Amen. We, 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 we get caught up, caught up in listening, listening to man. Man says this, and sometimes, you know, men, and I say men, that includes women, are not always led by the Holy Spirit in what they teach and preach. You know, so we must listen to the Holy Spirit and seek guidance. And again, if something stirs in your spirit, if something doesn't seem right, and that's what happened, to, you know, happened to me along this journey journey of of writing and re, you know researching and writing the you know the tithing hoax with my co-author. You know, I was watching television, 
And remember, I didn't know anything about tithing. I just knew tithing meant 10%. But I'm watching this preacher on television. And the things he's saying about tithing, it, it, it just didn't sit well with my spirit. And I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what was wrong. But I just knew something was wrong. And through the research and, 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 and writing the book and co-writing the book, okay, I discovered <laughs> what was wrong. So that was the Holy Spirit speaking to me on that. So, you know, so study the word for yourself, you, you know. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's right. I think that's what we definitely have to do regarding any subject. If it, especially if you get what I call, and I'm sure you do too, that check in your spirit that something ain't right. Mm -hmm. That means you need to look in and press in and get in the book. And see if what's being said to you is indeed correct. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. I've I've discovered things, I'm telling you, sometimes blow your mind. That we have been taught. And then this goes across the gamut in the Christian faith. That mm -hmm. we're discovering now, especially in these latter days. That <laughs> just wasn't true. Boy, there's some big old lies they've been telling from these pulpits. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it even goes back even in history as to even why some of this stuff, just like you were saying about these these Roman emperors, mm -hmm. the, you didn't even know this heavy influence. If you don't go research that they had in the church, it even mm -hmm. caused certain you know that about the holidays, right? They renamed mm -hmm. all of the the Hebrew feasts, for example, and put pa paganized them, and all. We learning about all that stuff now yeah. but only if you get into the book and compare what we've been told <laughs> to what to what the bible actually says yeah. and there's many examples like that so we, we shouldn't even be astonished well i mean i guess you would i guess you would when it comes to the money thing <laughs> though because <laughs> i want to ask you one more question and we, then we're going to get to that one which is the the question i want to ask you right now is is it your opinion that christians actually bring themselves under a curse by tithing. Hmm. Well, it's not. It, it's not. It's not my opinion. It's, this is according to what the Bible says. And tithing is a part of the Mosaic Law. God incorporated tithing into the Law of Moses, and what. The body of Christ must again understand, understand, understand about the Mosaic Law, is that it was pretty much an all all or nothing proposition, as I like to say, because there, according to biblical scholars, there are 613 commandments of the Mosaic Law, and with this law, ancient Israel had to follow all of the law. If they followed 612, got you know 600 and 612 commandments and got that right, but they missed that one, they were still breaking the law. And the Bible makes it clear. Again, you can go back to Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the curses, is that breaking the law resulted in curses. And I also want to draw attention to Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. I'm not going to read all of it, but it says, for as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So when preachers tell, command, or coerce, whatever, Christians to tithe is placing Christians under the law. Mm. And so by being placed back under the, not, well, placed under the law, then they're governed by the stipulations of that law. You got to do it all or if you don't do it all, you are cursed. So you can't, you couldn't, you can't just tithe and not do everything else. So if you just tithe, 
you're still breaking the law according to the law. And what is so that's right? All everything that you just like, if I took out a piece of paper, I'm sorry to interrupt you. If I took mm -hmm. out a piece of paper and we were doing math and math class, and I said, okay, plus, plus, or minus, it all adds up. Everything you just said, the Bible says. If we don't do everything that the law says, we've broken it because we right. got to do every bit of it. And if you miss one, you're guilty of all. So, of all. which is what we keep pointing out under grace. <laughs> grace is better mm -hmm. because you couldn't keep the law anyway. It was to bring you to an end of yourself and bring you to Christ. But legalists tell you, you have to keep the law. And I'm going, I'm scratching my head mm -hmm. and I'm like, are you crazy? Because you cannot keep 613 commandments. Which, you know, which is, I, I, see, if I was back there, sister, and they said, you got to, I've been like, Lord, okay. I know what publicly everybody's saying. Privately, I'd have been like, help me, God. I can't do it. <laughs> right. I can't do all this. No, which is why we have a new and better covenant. And see, and, here, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lisa. I just, I just shouted out, "Amen." I'm <laughs> okay. So, so I'm like, so we're just gonna ignore, just ignore that fact. The whole New Testament church is based on the New Covenant. So why you, why place Christians under the law? And what is interesting is that Christians, biblical Christians were Gentiles. Gentile people were never under the Mosaic law anyway. The Mosaic law was for the Hebrew people. Never. The nation of Israel, right. The nation of Israel. Never Gentiles. So why in modern times now do you want to take Christians and put them <laughs> under a law that was never for Gentiles? Period. Well, you we know, know why. <laughs> you know, so. We you know, know why. We can see the manipulation in that. You know, and I, and I want to just go back, you know, go back to scripture again, back to Galatians to kind of drive this point home. That, you know, it says in verse 11 of, of Galatians uh, chapter three, you know, but but that no man is justified by the law. In the sight of God. I'm sorry, sister. Wait a minute. Hold on. I, did I hear you right? Hold on. Could you say that again? How many men are justified by the law? No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. And tithing is a part of that law. And also right. says, and the law is not of faith. The man that doeth them shall live in them. So following the law is not an is not an act of faith. Oh, you just dropped a bomb right there. Oh, I could just rejoice for about 10 minutes on that one. <laughs> and the Bible says the just shall live by what? Faith. 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 The just the shall live by faith. Amen. Praise the, the Lord. Lord. It says again, and Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So as believers, we've been redeemed. Pastors, we've been redeemed. Why put believers under the curse of the law when Christ has redeemed us from that? So. That's right. Praise the Lord. Amen, Lord. sister. That's right. It clearly says we've been redeemed from the curse of the law and we're not supposed to go back under Hebrews. I always say this Hebrews, pay attention. Book with your name on it. Is a repeat repudiation keeping, keeping from the beginning to the end. It is warning. It literally says, if you return to the works of the law, you are fallen from grace. That's the only mm. time you even see the New Testament say that you can even be fallen from grace. And that's to return to the works of the law. That's why I know when I hear people talking about we got to keep the law as believers, what they're saying, 
I'm like, that is not what the Bible says. To mm-hmm. even attempt to do so is blasphemy to the Lord. But they don't get it. They they, so they look at all these scriptures that were only it's, only, it's only speaking to the nation of Israel about, and try to put it on the church. And I'm like, yes. that's the most grave error of all, which includes, mm-hmm. for example, the tithing hoax, because that was under the Mosaic law. Mm-hmm. Now let's, <laughs> let's like, go... Like- yeah, it's like, look, either you're going to live under grace in the New Testament or you're going to live under the law, the law of Moses. What's it going to be? Because it's like you can't do both. <laughs> it's, it's like one or the and other. And I do both. Okay. It's one or the other. And that's why I think that's why it uses such strong language there. To be like, you want to be falling from grace? Because I know I don't. I know I need grace every day of my life and twice on Sunday. I mean, I need it every day. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I wake up thanking him for his grace. Thanking him for his mercy. Mm. Woo! Mm. Okay. (laughs) Praise Mm -hmm. the Lord. Uh, Now, we touched on this, but I want to go back to it because you didn't really get into it. Did the tithe consist of money? Because a lot of preachers want to fight on this. I heard one very well-known program. Uh, This came up. I said, somebody must have been reading Sister Renee's book. Because they called in and they asked them, uh, did the tithe consist of money? And this person doubled down, this particular minister. Oh, yes, it absolutely did. And I'm like, uh, no, it didn't. But <laughs> could you ex- explain mm-hmm. that? And Because they, they trick people with this. I saw him do it. He didn't really explain it, but he wiggled out of it. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us, did the tithe consist of money according to this? The short answer, according to the Bible, is no. Repeatedly throughout the Bible, uh, the Old Old Testament, it mentions the biblical tithe was always crops, herds, cattle, oils, seeds, wine. It was anything the ancient Israelites could eat or drink. It was anything that was harvested from the land. God did not ask for silver. He did not ask for gold. I've even heard, I, back in the day, I even heard a preacher say, well, the real only reason why God didn't, you know, uh, why, why God wanted ties in the form of agricultural produce is because there was no, there was no monetary system. Well, that's not true. And we point out in in the tithing hoax, there are many instances where people use gold and silver as currency to make purchases. So money did exist. So if God wanted money, he would have said, bring me your money. But according to, I'm going to give some scriptural references here. You can go to Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. You can go to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 17. You can go to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23. And in each of these verses, it clearly lets us know that tithe wasn't money ever. That's not what God asked for. He asked for the crops. He asked for agricultural produce that was grown from the land, harvested from the land. Point blank period. And the only time money is referenced in relation to the tithe, we'll find in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse verses 24 through 26. And this was at the time where the ancient Israelites did not have a central location. They didn't have the, the temple had not been established. So they didn't have a central location to bring all the tithes. So there would be different locations that the Israelites would have to travel. So if the distance was too far for some ancient Israelites and it was too far for them to carry all of their tithe of cattle and herds and of grains and other agricultural produce, if it was too far and, you know, because there's a possibility that some of the food could have ruined and this, that, and the other, what they would do was when they got to the location when the Lord had determined where they would come to gather, they could take their money 
and buy the tithe, meaning they could buy the agricultural produce. So they would exchange the money for the tithe. So they then would take the tithe and, and feast. They would eat and drink the tithe. You can't eat and drink silver and gold or whatever monetary exchange. So throughout the Bible, it consistently shows and illustrates that the tithe was not money. It was ag agricultural produce, crops and, and cattle. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I knew that. I remember that fact from your book when I read it the first time. I was like, I remember that because when when that preacher I was just talking about was on TV and the person was trying to explain to him it was never money and he wiggled out of it. Mm -hmm. I said, but see, you missing this point. And this was the one that I went to as proof when I was arguing, because you know how you talk to the TV, right? That's not right, you know. And I was like, and I was like, that's not right because the tie was never money. Because if they went somewhere, like like you said, they were not centralized, everything you just explained. And I remembered that fact, and I was like, no, because then they would just purchase whatever the offering needed to be mm -hmm. and then give that to the priest. I said, see, these people, <laughs> I was like, that's right in the Bible. I was like, I don't even know. That's why I said he wiggled on out of that. And then they do that thing that they that you can do when you're in control of the microphone. They took the mic, so they just hung up on the person and moved on to some, somebody mm -hmm. else. <laughs> Praise right. the Lord. Right. And, you know, and just another quick point that just, you know, it's just coming to mind is that, you know, unfortunately, with some of these preachers, they know their congregation doesn't read the Bible like that. <laughs> they know that that many believers are not well versed um, in the Bible. And so they're able to some of them, some preachers are able to take advantage of people's ignorance. And again, and, and please, you know, hear my heart. I'm not saying ignorant, ignorant, I mean, not dumb or stupid. Their parishioners don't know, uh, really know about tithing. And so some are able to just take advantage of that. And so whatever they say, whatever the preacher says about tithing people, many believers just accept it because they, you know, sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. So, so I just wanted mm -hmm. to kind of make that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when you don't know what you don't know, people can take advantage of your ignorance. And like I did on you there, on you there. That's all ignorance because people use that as a as a derogatory. But ignorant just mean you don't know. Yeah, don't I've know. actually used it. And people are puzzled when I do. I'm like, oh, I'm ignorant on that. Could you please illuminate me? Like like we talked about in our first conversation the truth will make you free but i took you, know, you, know, you off a little bit <laughs> remember yeah, we talked yeah. about that right. it's going to take, so, yeah. it's going to take you off first. if you out there starting to get a little angry bob says be angry and sin night you got a right to be angry if you got hoodwinked bamboozled bushwhacked snookered horn swoggled and you see how this has really put shackles on the church and bondage on on people who don't know, who want to serve God, and they actually use that as a manipulative tool to get you to pay the tithe. And it's, it is infuriating when you think about it. And it seemed like, you know, they use Malachi, will a man rob God? But look how many men have been robbing us. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you a question, because this is going to be the next logical question that ministers preachers are going to ask which is if these people aren't paying the tithe how can a church sustain itself without the tithe okay the church can sustain itself through generous giving from the congregation again you know as i said earlier the new testament church thrived for 300 to 800 years off free will offerings you know, and so, you know, you, preachers can teach their congregations 
how to give under grace. Because I, you know, because I, I, I believe, you know, if you belong to a church, you know, you, you should want, and you're being fed at that church, you should want to uh, uh, support that church financially um, in a way that you're able to. And, and that's why I like in uh, how the Apostle Paul, you know, he, he, he breaks it down how on how to give you know he he encourages the saints to give he doesn't command or demand the saints to give he encourages to give he talks about being a cheerful giver and also getting out of your abundance give should not leave you stressed out wondering how you're going to pay this bill pay that bill no take care of your household first and what you have left over is really your abundance. And so you can give out of your abundance. Giving should never be a burden. Tithing has been a burden because it's legalistic. It has that spirit of legalism attached to it. But giving under grace is about freely giving, giving, voluntarily giving, and giving from your heart. And see, that's that's the that's the thing. It's a heart issue. Tithing under the law was legalistic. It's like, oh, let me do this because I gotta do it. I gotta do it. Versus giving under grace is like I'm giving because I want to give. I want to. I want to be a blessing to to my my church. I want to be a blessing to uh, people who who outside of my church, to the homeless, or to whomever. And developing the love of being a generous giver. And that's a matter of the heart. And that's what the Most High is looking at. What is the condition of your heart? Because if you're not going to be a cheerful giver, I think even the Apostle Paul says, well, if you're not going to, you know, don't, you don't give grudgingly. Just, just keep it. Just, just keep your money. You know, just keep it to yourself. But, you know, but I think that is... Uh, a thing for or for pastors, preachers to strive for in, in this day and time is to teach people how to give and the benefits of giving under grace and how to become a cheerful giver. So you you won't find yourself as a man or woman of God in the pulpit trying to coerce and trying to manipulate and trying to force people like, oh, no, come on. No, it, that is over for that. It's over for that. Oh, yeah. This truth needs to come out. The church needs to come out of this bondage. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that are that are false that are in the church that need to be broken in these in these last days, the last moments of the last days, because God always intended with the arrival of Christ to make men free, to liberate us from these shackles. And there's a whole lot of them that need to just be broken with the truth. And mm -hmm. this is one of them. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to see that happen because I know what it feels like. And I'm sure you sure you do to the sister and so do many others out there what it feels like to be in bondage to something hmm. and how that oppression bears down on you that hmm. you don't even have any peace in your heart about whatever that particular thing is hmm. and it weighs on you day in and day out it would be like somebody putting a hundred two hundred three hundred pound weight on your back and making you carry it everywhere you go Mm -hmm. eventually that's going to wear you down and that's mm -hmm. not what God wants us in he doesn't want us in that kind of spirit or that kind of attitude or that kind of oppression and so mm -hmm. when I see it this is how I know when something ain't right the fruit that it bears if mm -hmm. it makes men free if it liberates people now always always this is always connected to righteousness not unrighteousness I'm not talking about the liberty the world talks about do as thou wilt I'm not talking about yeah. that stuff talking about drop. being free in mm -hmm. christ and mm -hmm. and that freedom that he brings you is liberating and it's it brings peace it brings joy and, and so when i don't see that as a result 
coming from some of these ministries and stuff with some of this stuff that they're doing. I know if the fruit is bad, the root is bad. Mm-hmm. So when I see people being liberated and set free and giving glory to God for everything that's happening to them, then I see the fruit. I know it's good because the fruit is good. Mm-hmm. This is how we know when it's connected to God. But people, people we miss that. It's like if people are walking around acting like they baptize and lemon juice and bitter and angry and, <laughs> and, so and all that. How, that's not the spirit of the Lord. Right. That ought to let you know a church ain't right. Mm. You know, <laughs> but when people come in and they they being told the truth and the truth is being disseminated and we all have liberty and we're all one in Christ and we're moving in the spirit and it's not this oppressive spirit there. We we see by the fruit that that church bears whether or not it's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is no different. This is connected to that. And I just want to add on, uh, uh, kind of add or follow up on the question about how can the you know church survive without the tides. And I just know just from my own personal experience in the church, you know, I. I was baptized in and and, and I grew up go, attending. We we never collected tithes. We had, like I said earlier, we had church dues and we we paid, you know, we gave offerings and our church survived. Uh my co-author Cynthia, her church the same way. They didn't collect tithes. We weren't exposed to no tithe doctrine. We gave free will offerings. In, in, in church news. And the church is still standing. It's <laughs> still the churches, are, you know what I'm saying? The churches are still in existence. We don't, you know, so this whole notion that, oh, the church is going to fall apart and the churches can't survive if they don't tie, that's, 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 well, I have anecdotal evidence that that's not true. You know, I have the historical evidence with the New Testament church and I have my own personal experience. That churches, they're churches who do sustain themselves from the free will, generous giving of their of their congregations. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, maybe the motivation. And as I've said before, I don't understand how there's these ministries with millions and millions and millions of dollars in their church coffers, as they call it. And yet there's zero to, to hardly any outreach or they don't even have anything for the homeless or the hurting or the widows or the orphans, but they got millions of dollars sitting in their coffers or they considering going out and buying a $60 million plane, you know, cause they mm. can't fly commercial. They're too good to fly commercial. So even, even first class, they're, they're too good for that. So I I, 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 I shake my head. I'm like, I don't even know how do we allow this to happen mostly is because we uh, weren't being good Bereans and we got got because they never could have Jedi mind tricked us <laughs> that we studied this out because it's right here in the Bible. And we'd have been mm-hmm. like, nope, I'm supposed to just be a cheerful giver. That's what my mother told you. That's what my mother arrived at. She's like, nope, I'm just supposed to be a cheerful giver. And being in bondage to the tithe is not, I can't do that. I'll give a free will offering. And if that ain't good enough, too bad, so sad mm-hmm. <laughs> for you. I'm happy. So, okay. I, I do. That's right. <laughs> Sister Renee, I want to ask you, what is the feedback you have received from writing the book? I'm sure you got some positive, but you probably also got some negative. And I'd like to give a couple examples of the things, a couple of things that may have made a lasting impression on you. Well, um, initially, when the book was first published in 2008, and and I had also launched the uh, the uh, Tide Hub YouTube channel as a complement to to the book, uh, there there was some uh, negative feedback. There were believers who who criticized the message. Um, but honestly, overall, the feedback um, since then has been has been positive. Um, 
yeah, I've had I've had more people, um, you know, reaching out and and thanking us for for the the book message and how it has has helped helped them. I think the main thing about the Tiding hoax is that it was confirmation for a lot of people who felt the teachings about tithing weren't correct. Again, you know, I think they had that that stirring that something wasn't right. And finding out about the tithing hoax and, and reading the book or watching the videos and or going to our tithinghoax.com website, it really helped them gain confirmation and, and also clarity um, on the topic. Because one of the things that was very important uh, to uh, Cindy and I when we began working on the book was to keep the topic and to explain the topic of tithing as clear and as straightforward as possible. And because in reality, the topic of tithing is really, a, for the most part, it's a simple, it's really a simple, straightforward topic. But because there have been so many different teachings, false teachings, um, that some, some preachers have made it a very complicated topic. <laughs> so we wanted to simplify everything down as much as possible and and rely on biblical scripture to expose the false teachings and to correct those those teachings but i think the, the but overall since 2008 overall the the feedback has been positive like i said there were some naysayers and people who did not like what we were saying um but um, so there was there was some pushback and some criticism. Um, but overall, the positive has outweighed the negative feedback. That's a blessing. Thank you. What Thank you. are you doing now? What do you presently find yourself working on? Um, right now, um, I'm in the process of rebranding and expanding the content on the Tithing Hoax YouTube uh, channel um, because there are more issues um, taking place in the in the body of Christ and, and a, lot of, a lot of other issues going on with the church that that need to be addressed. And um, and and unfortunately tithing isn't the only um, false doctrine <laughs> in the church. But I'm just kind of just taking my time to see what direction I'm going to go in and, um, you know, seeking guidance and uh, from the Holy Spirit on um, on what direction to go in with with the platform, um, because there's a lot more that I I want to share, a lot more I want to offer uh, to believers. And, you know, I feel very strongly that this is the season and this is the hour to replace the kingdom of Satan with the kingdom of God here on earth. Uh, that is our assignment as believers, as those who are chosen, who are the children of the most high. And, uh, you know, and part of that involves exposing the wickedness of the uh of satan's kingdom uh, because i see what i what i see happening with many believers is that they're getting caught up and caught up in satan's tra traps and um you know and i'm just here to do my part to expose um satan's wickedness uh to, to shed light bring light to the darkness and to draw people out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. So, um, 
So that's kind of like where I'm headed at this point in just expanding the platform beyond uh, the topic of tithing. What other books have you written? Uh, yes. Um, I have a book called Satan's Sex Scandal, The Truth Behind the Bishop Eddie Long Scandal. I also have the book called God, Why Am I Still Single? Nine Answers to Take You from Single to I Do. That's a little something for the sisters out there looking for a godly husband. And uh, the most recent book is The End Times Pandemic, The Last Day's Prophecy for Christians, Preachers, and the Black Church. Sister Renee, do you have any future books or projects that you'd like to talk about? Um, definitely one project, and it's been on my to-do list forever, it seems like, is to revise and update um, the tithing hoax. And, and I also uh, have in the works, uh, I have a rough draft of a book where I explore you know, Christianity um, as a spiritual way of life versus Christianity as religion. Um, so I kind of, I, I say it like this, I don't know what the title of the book is going to be, but I, I say, I call it God Hates Religion. And the premise is that if you go back to Genesis, you'll find that God didn't intend for us to have religion. He intended for us to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. But when we look out in, into this world, we'll be, we are overwhelmed with religion. So we have a whole lot of religion, but very little relationship. So I, that's something I wanted to, to explore. Um, um, and that was, it kind of takes me back to, to um, a Bible study I attended years ago. And the teacher said, Christianity is a spiritual way of life. And that stayed with me. And I believe it, it should be a spiritual way of life, not a religious life, but a spiritual way of life. So that's something I'm looking at exploring, as well as um, I'm looking into writing, producing more videos and some video essays and documentaries that will inform, inspire, and empower uh, the children of the Most High uh, to help usher in the kingdom of God here in this earth realm. Yeah, I often say on my podcast, <laughs> it's kind of funny that, that you said that because I know most believers who understand that this is not a religion, they know it's relationship. And this is the point we're always making. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of people that are quote unquote Christian, but it's a religion. Here's all the to do's, you know, do this, do that. And it ends up becoming very, very legalistic. And I remember I, I kept saying on my podcast, and this is a boast for the Lord, not for me. I kept saying on my podcast, especially during the, I call it the scam, pandemic, 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 mm -hmm. pandemic. I'll get it right one day. <laughs> uh, which is that this is not just a Christian social club, is it? Mm -hmm. And one, I, I don't know if they were male or female, it doesn't matter to me. It's just that you can't tell when you're in the chat if people don't identify mm -hmm. what they are. It doesn't matter. But they 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 said when I first started saying it, he said, Sister, I didn't understand what you were driving at. Because I kept saying, this is not just a Christian social club. We're supposed to be leaning the everlasting arms. And when I'm encouraging people to, to, to cry out to the Lord and lean on him and question him and ask him and wait on the answer and all these different things, right? He mm. finally, he or she finally came back and said, I got it now. I understand what you're saying. This is not just religion. It's relationship. Mm -hmm. And, 
you know, like I say, I always say, if you know, you know. And if you don't know, get into the book <laughs> and start. Mm -hmm. Stop looking at it with these legalistic eyes and understand that God is talking to a, a particular people. When he walked this earth, he was mostly talking to the nation of Israel, but Gentiles was listening. <laughs> and Gentiles was saying, I want some of that. And you see where he gave them some of that. And you see throughout the book, even in the Old Testament, there's a scripture that says, in his name will the Gentiles trust. And that's repeated in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was always intended. People don't realize the purpose for Israel was not to be in self-aggrandizement, which is what got them in trouble mm -hmm. with, with the mm -hmm. Lord. Because he's like, mm -hmm. they had that attitude that Jonah had. I ain't preaching to them heathens. And he said, mm -hmm. oh, you think not? Okay. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so it was for three purposes. The first was to be a peculiar people, to be an example to the rest of the world. That was mm -hmm. always the purpose. Mm -hmm. The second, to uh, bring forth the promised Messiah. And mm -hmm. third, to and preach the gospel about the Messiah. But some kind of way <laughs> people mm -hmm. don't see that is laid out in the book, which is why when they got into idolatry, judgment came. Why? How are you going to be an example to the world of who the living God is and you worshiping idols too? Yes. <laughs> yes. So now I'm going to judge you and the judgment will be an astonishment that I am the living God because can't no idol judge you. So people will go, Wow. Look at their punishments. Their God must be God. So he's like, if it won't be me blessing you that you're going to allow the world to see, then it'll be the curses. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then he always reserved for himself, as the Bible said, a believing remnant, people that did not bow to Baal, and mm -hmm. those will be the one preaching the gospel. And whether people want to believe it or not, mm -hmm. the gospel message was in test testament they were believing on the promised messiah this is why in hebrews hebrews pay attention the book says abraham believed god and it was accounted him for righteousness what did he believe god for it wasn't isaac it was that christ was coming through isaac it literally says so it said moses counted the suffering of christ greater riches wait a minute jesus when he spoke he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Wait, wait, wait. How Abraham know about you, Jesus? They were believing for the promised Messiah. The hmm. people in the Old Testament were looking for Christ's coming. This is why Simeon was at the temple when Jesus is, is being presented. Uh, according to the custom of, of a man being circumcised on the eighth day, a man child. And hmm. Uh, Anna the prophetess is there. They knew he was coming. This is what blows my mind that people miss this in the scripture. And they try to make it all about the law in the Old Testament. And I truly believe we know that the Bible says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, but it was mm -hmm. also a way to receive rewards. If you were obedient, you got blessed. If you mm -hmm. were disobedient and fell into transgression, you got judged to bring you back in the line. So... <laughs> I just, mm -hmm. I, and that's still, that's still uh, translate in the New Testament. And I keep trying to warn folk, the same God of the old covenant is the same God of the new. This is why the mm -hmm. Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son. And we mm -hmm. know if you fall into transgression, even under grace, the Holy Spirit going to chasten you. That's right. But they, they act like that don't exist. I'm going, hold up. I know when he spanked my behind for doing stuff that was wrong. How are you going how you gonna pretend that don't come on now? Because the Bible says if you don't receive chastisement, you're not a son. Right. So I'll be like, y'all need to examine your faith if yeah, you're not that, having that experience. Mm-hmm. That chastisement, that conviction is real. <laughs> <laughs> and real. then they then you know what we get accused of when we start talking like that. You're legalistic. No, we're mm -hmm. being true to what this Bible says and what our experience is as believer and every be as believers and every believer knows if you fall into transgression because the same God that said that um, to flee fornication 
in the Old Testament, you're supposed to be married, said it in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So I, I warn saints, look, he's just, and, just, and he is merciful. But when he's calling to you, as the Bible says, when you hear his voice, it's also in the book of Hebrews, harden not your heart. So as, as the people did in, in the wilderness, the Bible said, so because when you do, now he's going to have to deal with you. It's obedience is better than sacrifice. So mm -hmm. be obedient and come on out. That's the warning. So he don't have to spank you. But if you're not going to listen, then he's going to have to spank you. So I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I, I know that's every believer I ever talked to. They'd be like, hey, amen. So I know that was my experience. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. praise the Lord. Get into yeah. the scripture, get into the book and look, we ain't making it up. Final thoughts, sister, for today. Anything that the Lord has placed on your heart that you'd like to say to the people? Okay. Um, yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, one thing I, I, I definitely want to make it clear that that uh, when Cynthia and I uh, joined together to write this book, um, it was done with the, with the Holy Spirit leading. And it was done from a place of love, not a place of judging pastors or believers of the church. So it doesn't have a spirit of judgmentalism or, or, or criticism. Uh, we may offer some constructive criticism um, in the book, but you know we never bash pastors, preachers, never do that, we never bash the church. That's not the spirit we came in. It's really, uh, what we have here is something that was intended to to inform the body of Christ and to uh, equip the saints regarding the matter of tithing and present them with nothing but the biblical truth. So people could be set free and come out of the bondage of 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 false teachings and false teachers so and so we never never bash pastors we don't even we just dealt strictly with the doctrines not with the people teaching the doctrines that turned out to be false you know so we never got into personalities and we know that you know not all preachers teach falsely about tithing you know they're just some who do and not all of them intentionally in, or, or intend to deceive or mislead uh, the believers. Um, you have some preachers who simply don't know better because they're just teaching and preaching what they've been taught. So the book is for anyone, whether it's a Christian in the pool, the pastor in the pulpit, or the believer in the pew. Uh, the the book is honest is is straightforward but it's presented in a very loving manner so ideally i would not think anybody would be offended by what's in the book and um and secondly i also want to tell believers especially in this this day in this hour in this season this is the time for christians Hebrews, those who are chosen of the Most High, his children. This is the time to stand up for what you believe. Stand, and this is time to stand firm on the word, stand firm on the truth. Because what I am seeing now in this world, and we know that we know who the prince of the world of this world is, and I'm seeing too many people who are Christians being conformed to this world and they're not standing up for the gospel. They're not standing up for what the Bible teaches. They're not standing up for standards, values, and morals. And this is the time to stand up and not fear. Trust in the most high. We are here on assignment. And we are here to replace the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And this is a day and hour. We cannot straddle the fence 
either you're going to be with Satan's kingdom or you're going to be with God's kingdom. This is not the time to be lukewarm. So if you call yourself a Christian or you're Hebrew, or you're a believer, you're a child of the most high. We have to put in that work and stand up for the kingdom and represent the kingdom and not allow ourselves to be pushed around, bullied and manipulated by the devils and demons of this world. We have the victory. We have the victory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That's my word. Amen, Sister Renee. I truly appreciate that. And thank you for that admonishment and encouragement. And I concur. Um, the, the greatest, the greatest time that light shines is in the darkness. And we're supposed to let the love and light of Christ shine more glaring than ever. The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. And we know that our righteousness is of Christ. It is because of him that we can have the confidence to stand firm in his precepts and in his truth without fear. We're not supposed to fear. The Bible says we don't fear man. We fear the living God. We don't fear the one who can destroy the body, but rather fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell so we ain't afraid because we know if god be for us who can be against us and we're supposed to speak the truth of the word of god in love but bring that fire honey because because our god as it says in hebrews which is the theme for this podcast fire is a consuming fire and on that note we're gonna go ahead and close out the podcast thank you sister renee for joining me today and for illuminating these things for us according to the scripture we truly appreciate your time and i want to encourage everybody to go out and get the book the tithing hoax exposing the lies misrepresentations and false teachings about tithing by r period renee and cynthia harper it is available on amazon sister can you tell us might be available is it uh kindle is it uh audible where where else is it available yes it's available um as a kindle version as well as paperback and uh wherever books are sold you can get a copy of it praise the lord so okay sister thank you so much um unless there's something else you'd like to say before you go oh thank you so much lisa thank you for having me